Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to session 14 of the Treason of Isengard class. We are getting close to the end of the book, though of course not quite as quickly as we were originally supposed to. Um, I, uh, Those of you who uh, attend through uh, GoToWebinar will already have noticed that I added an extra session. We're definitely going to have to do one more week. Um, but I think we can do it in only one more week, which is kind of cool actually, uh, given that I had scheduled... I scheduled 15 weeks, right? So, um, uh, 16 weeks at a, on 15 plan. That's that's pretty good, actually. That's that's not that's not bad at all. Um, so anyway, yeah, what that's uh, that's going to be the plan. So we'll have so the final session for the Treason of Isengard will be on November 8th, right? Yes, Wednesday, November 8th, uh, and then we'll be off for two weeks, uh, and uh, then I hope to start. Our next class, our next, uh, our next Mythgard Academy session, um, at the end of the month, probably the 29th of uh, November, either the 29th of November or that first Wednesday in December, one of those two, probably the 29th of, Dece of uh, November. Um, but that um, that also means that it's uh, time to start electing our new, uh, our new, uh, our new books that we're what we're going to do next uh so and of course we're starting it's this is going to sort of new in two ways right on the one hand we're starting sort of a new cycle so having just finished our fundraising campaign uh there are many wonderful people who have uh donated a hundred dollars or more for the first time and are just now coming onto the council of the wise and even for you veterans there's a, a new system that we're using uh through the Mythgard forum uh so uh anyway i hope that um uh, you guys who are in the Council of the Wise have been able to find your way through. If you've seen the email from uh, Dr. Powell, I hope that you will respond to that and get yourself set up there so you can contribute to the nomination process because that does need to move forward, the nomination process and the voting thereafter. So please do, uh, um, please do get in there uh, with your nominations and be a part of that process to help decide what we do next. Uh, this is, of course, obviously, I always really look forward to the uh, to our to our Tolkien times, uh, and and I don't want to prejudge anything, but you know I'm sort of guessing that there may be some people interested in going ahead to the War of the Ring, which is the next uh, next volume in the history of Middle Earth, and uh, finishing off or mostly finishing off the uh, uh, the history of the War of the Rings. I'm not going to prejudge or anything, but you know that's been it has been a trend uh, that that seems likely to continue. So the real adventure comes in between, right? Because we always do. We never do two author two books in a row by the same author. So uh, the next one will be a non-Tolkien work, and which non-Tolkien work are we going to do next? Um, is uh, this is that's always the real suspense uh, every time. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that. So make sure if uh, you are on the Council of the Wise that you get in on that discussion. You should have an email uh, uh, just in the last few days uh, from Dr. Powell. So do. Be on the lookout for that. Follow his instructions and get involved, and then you can help us figure out what we're going to be doing next. So, okay. Uh, so that's that's the first thing I wanted to make sure to uh, emphasize because I can't wait for that to uh, uh, for that to happen. Um, uh, Tony, great. If you didn't get an email, um, uh, send an email to uh, either info at or donate at signumu.org, either one of those, and we'll make sure, probably donate actually would probably be easier. So um, send an email to donate at signumu.org, and we'll we'll make sure to get you connected. Uh, it's possible there was some error in the email or uh, that, um, I don't know, it, it might have gotten sent to spam or something. You should check your spam just to make sure that it didn't get caught there or something but anyway we'll definitely we'll definitely uh make sure to to that you get included we don't want to leave anybody out who wants to be involved uh, there so um okay um the second thing that i wanted to announce today is that uh it's uh, i i announced this last week too but i wanted to repeat that again uh, i am really excited about our regional events this is one of the big new things that mythgard is doing uh now that i would really love to see mythgard um uh, sort of encouraging more and more of. I just love. I've. I, I just love going around and connecting with people, and uh, and you know, I'm really looking forward to doing more of that. So uh, let's get some more of that together. And of course, coming up, we have Tex Moot, uh, our our ev our regional event down in Texas. That's on January 13th in Fort Worth. Go to Tex Moot. 
tex.org, T-E-X-M-O-O-T.org. Uh, and uh, you can find not only the information about the conference, but also um, the form for uh, submitting a paper idea for a uh, for their uh, call for papers. There have been a lot of really great paper topic ideas that have come out of Mythgard Academy sessions. Uh, many of the, the, the ideas that you guys pose would be really neat to... Uh, uh, to work out in more detail, uh, and uh, the a regional moot is a really great opportunity uh, to do that in a really, um, uh, in, in a really uh, a sort of a low, low pressure, you know, high support kind of environment. So uh, I hope you'll consider doing that. Um, Stephen, I had a quick question about the nomination process. Uh, how long is the nomination part of the process going on? I don't know exactly. It'll be it'll be at least a at least a week. Um, there are basically three stages to the process, Stephen. Right? There's the open nomination, right, and like general discussion on the discussion board um, for you know pros and cons and people lobbying and stuff for their nominees. Then there's the voting among the council of the wise to decide the final panel um, of, uh, of finalists that then get sent uh, to the entire electorate. So there's. Uh, there, there's, there's, so the first open nominations, then the deciding the finalists and then the voting on the, uh, the actual winners. So, uh, you know, so we've got what, like, uh, four weeks or so and, uh, uh, to do those three stages. So, you know, next, next week ish, I think something like that. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. So I, I, I encourage you to, again, I encourage you to take part in that. I encourage you to think about text moot. And I also encourage you uh, to uh, think about getting involved in a regional event near you. It's something that, again, as I said, I'm excited about. If, if, this, if this is something you would really like to see, um, if you would like to, to help, if you'd like to volunteer to help us bring an event near you, um, it's uh, not a whole lot of work and we have resources to help folks. Um, uh, but uh, just if it's something you'd be interested in doing, we'd love to love to see that. Um, I'm uh, I'm excited to to see that happen. So uh, definitely send us an email info at signumu.org and we will uh, we'll we'll talk to you about that. See what we see what we can do. Um, uh, good good and the oh, so okay one more one more little announcement. So this weekend, um, I. <laughs> Okay, so I don't have a time to announce for this. Um, my, for those of you who follow me uh, on Twitter, especially, um, may have been I've been tweeting about the fact that my uh, my two sons are are listening to Martin Shaw's recording of the Silmarillion with me now, which is funny because neither one of them have read the Lord of the Rings, but they're reading the Silmarillion first, so it's kind of surreal for me to imagine my children growing up in a world in which they read the Silmarillion first before the Lord of the Rings, which is like a world I can barely imagine myself. But um, uh, anyway, uh, so... So we're, 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 we're reading the Silmarillion and this is all down to, uh, this is all thanks to, uh, to the German band Blind Guardian and their, uh, their heavy metal Nightfall in Middle Earth album, um, uh, which came out, what, like back in the nineties, didn't it? Um, anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful album for those of you who don't know it. I recommend it. It's really great. Um, and, uh, and no, Stephen, see, this is not a completionist thing. My sons are not doing this in completionist order. Indeed, we didn't even start the Silmarillion at the beginning. Because you see, they love this album. They love the Nightfall and Middle Earth album. And this is how it grew, right? They were just listening to it because they enjoyed the music. And then, you know, my younger son, Matthias, started asking me stories about, you know, like, what are the stories behind this? What is this song about? So I started telling him the stories. And, um, and uh, even my older 14-year-old son was kind of grudgingly interested in the stories when I was telling them. So yeah, so Bria, they're 14 and nine right now. And, um, and anyway, so, so I was like, Hey, so, uh, you know, would you guys like to actually hear the real stories? Uh, you know, the full versions of the stories. And they were like, yeah, yeah, well, we kind of would. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I mean, obviously I've got Martin Shaw on my phone. Right. So I'm like, you know, just, uh, uh, uh clicked a few buttons and off we went. Um, we started with the darkening of Valinor. Uh, uh, because that's where the album starts, you know. So we start with the darkening of Valinor up through uh, uh, Morgoth and the uh, thieves' quarrel with Ungoliant. Um, we um, 
anyway, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been, it's been great fun. And my younger son, Matthias is very enthusiastic to do, uh, a discussion. This was his, his idea. He wants to do, uh, a, uh, a, a, a podcast episode with me, a broadcaster, like probably actually a series, an irregular series of broadcasts where we go through and we talk about the album, uh, 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 song by song and l- think about their adaptation, the relationship between the songs and the stories and things like that. So he's, uh, he's very enthusiastic about this. So I'm like, okay, so basically it's going to, it's kind of going to be like, um, you know, uh, like take your kid to work day, Tolkien professor style, <laughs> essentially. Um, so it's going to be fun. I'm really looking forward to this. So we'll, we'll like play some of the music. We'll look at the lyrics. We'll talk about it. We'll think about the relationship with the story. Um, and I think it's just going to be me and Matthias. My older son is not so interested in being on camera. But um, I, the problem is I don't know a time because my nine-year-old son has an enormously complicated social sc- uh, calendar that of which I am not the master. So uh, nor is all that goes on two legs as far as I know. But anyway, um, so I can't say exactly what the time is going to be. Uh, it'll be sometime this weekend, I think. So the best thing you can do uh, if you would like to attend this um, we'll definitely be broadcasting it we'll be broadcasting it primarily on Twitch uh, so if you subscribe to our Twitch channel twitch.tv slash then you'll get a notification, you'll get an email notification when a stream starts and so you'll be able to tell when that's going on I will also be announcing that uh, over Twitter and stuff like that so uh yeah, yeah, <laughs> good, yeah. Uh, Tim Fisher says that uh, at least we know that if exploring the Lord of the Rings is still going on into the 2060s, uh, I will have an heir to pass it off to. Perhaps, uh, perhaps Tim. That is, uh, we'll see. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, I, I'm not gonna rush into it, you know. Um, but because uh, uh, you know he's uh, right, right, right now, you know, my son Matthias is in train to be like the Pokemon professor. Basically, he, he is a, he is he is an expert in Pokemon, uh, uh, and I am the student there. But we'll see, we'll see. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess I try not to pressure my kids, right? But this was uh, so. But I obviously I couldn't resist, you know, when uh, uh, when an idea like this pops up, and I'm like, hey, cool, yeah. So anyway, so that's that's um, that's what we're gonna do. Um, <laughs> Brianna also wants to have a stream about Pokemon. You know, Bree, all you gotta do is show up and start asking him questions about Pokemon, and off off he'll go. You know, he'll. Uh, um, one of the things, uh, Bree, that he and I do, um, we'll do this like quiz game where he will, he'll name a Pokemon move, and he'll ask me to guess. And so, so he names a move, and I guess what type of Pokemon has that move, right? It's a really interesting game to try to guess, you know, and of course, you know, he's always throwing me curveballs of ones that I couldn't ever possibly guess. Uh, but, uh, it's really, it's really interesting. Actually. I, I, I find, but I am a hundred percent sure uh, that if I had grown up, you know, 20 years later, I, I too would have been like a total Pokemon master that, uh, it, it is enthralling. You know, it's like the joys of taxonomy, right? I would have been all over that as a kid. Oh my goodness. Um, but, uh, anyway, we will, we will get there. Yeah. Steve and I agree. Uh, 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 Maggie, uh, from, you know, who was on the uh, fundraising stream. She's, she's obviously, uh, my heir. And if you guys haven't seen that segment, you, you want to, you want to see, you want to see me completely stumped, you know, by a 12 year old girl, um, uh, who, you know, in her first question, in, in a Q&A session that we did during the webathon, not only a- a- asked a question that stumped me, but that actually pointed out an inconsistency in The Lord of the Rings. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's Maggie. She's amazing. But uh, anyway, okay. Um, enough, uh, enough announcements. So sometime this weekend, we're going to do, we're going to do a fun stream talking about Silmarillion with my nine-year-old son, Matthias, and, uh, uh, doing a close analysis of Blind Guardian's adaptation of the Silmarillion stories, uh, in the Nightfall and Middle-Earth album. So, and then, again, there'll probably, I, I, I don't have any aspirations of getting through more than two or three songs, uh, in that, uh, in that episode. So, uh, I'm sure there will be more of them in the future, but anyway, all right. 
let us get into the Treason of Isengard because I've got a lot of stuff that I want to cover because today this is really exciting stuff, right? We actually get to the Rohirrim and uh, and Fangorn, the voyage of discovery that Tolkien goes on here. And this, to me, is amazing, actually. Um, there are several things that I find, well, okay, there are one or two things in today's class that I find mind-blowing. But the discovery thing is really just incredible, right? The way in which Tolkien... Just this stuff kind of unfolds in front of him, right? And he he finds it out. Uh, the fact that the the way in which the Uruk High chapter and the uh, and the Treebeard chapter just kind of open up. Finally, we're going to get Treebeard, right? We're going to get Treebeard and the Ants. And how do we get from Treebeard the Giant to Treebeard the Ant, right? Just in a heartbeat, right? Just all of a sudden, like that, uh, Treebeard the Ant emerges pretty much fully formed, uh, and that's really kind of amazing. So, in the hope that we'll actually get to Treebeard today and past the Orakai, let's uh, let's jump in. But I wanted to start with, I had kind of teased you guys last week with uh, my one slide I didn't get to last week, which was about that, that one reference that Christopher Tolkien gave to Tolkien's doodling uh, on the side of his paper while he was writing. Uh, and I thought this was really, this was really, really cool. Um, so Christopher says, while working on the book, my father would sometimes doodle by writing, often in careful or even elaborate script, names or phrases from a newspaper that lay beside him or on which his paper rested. On the back of the sheet, carrying this outline, an examination script like most of the paper he used, he wrote out many such odds and ends as Chinese bombers, North Sea convoy, and among them are Moir River and Japanese attack in Malaya. It is out of the question, I think, that these writings on the verso should come from a different time from the text on the recto. It is certain, therefore, that the time was now the winter of 1941-2. to Now, can I just say, this is really cool from a textual uh, studies standpoint. I mean, uh, whenever you get this kind of evidence, you know, when you're studying you know, textual provenance, and you get this kind of external fact uh, that, you know, as he says, you know, you can't totally prove that those doodles were at the same time as the writing, but it seems certainly prohibitively likely that it was. So the fact that, uh, you know, these random newspaper headlines that he's just ab apparently idly doodling on his paper are usable for dating purposes to confirm the time when, uh, uh, when this... Uh, uh, you know, when this was written, like, that's pretty neat, you know, and you've got to think, if, again, if you're somebody in, um, in Christopher Tolkien's position of, you know, trying to assemble all this stuff and figure out the dating and everything else, yeah, I mean, that's like gold, right? I mean, that's just like found treasure. If you can have something as specific as Japanese attack in Malaya and War River, right, on the back of the, on the back of the script. So, that's that's cool, and that's obviously Christopher's interest in it, and no no wonder, right? But I'm really interested in it for other reasons, right? Ex Nancy, exactly. Why is he writing down random words from the news? That habit of Tolkien's, which of course I I you know I wouldn't have guessed, right? Um, the idea that he is writing down, jotting down things in often in careful or even elaborate script. Not a surprise, right? That he would sort of doodle in the midst of his writing by writing ornate scripts somewhere. You know, that I, I do, doesn't surprise me a jot. Though I would have to think for Christopher, it would be kind of frustrating, right? To uh, to be reading through this almost totally illegible scrawl of his dad. And Tolkien's writing when he's going fast is really, really hard to read. Um, and then, like, be looking at this, like, gorgeously calligraphic, you know, Japanese attack in Malaya on the back of his thing. Like, it's got to be, it's got to be kind of frustrating. But, um, uh, I... Um, but Thomas, see, that's exactly the kind of thing that I was thinking. My, my, my question is, and obviously I don't want to go too far in this and I'm not trying to psychoanalyze Tolkien or anything, but like, what does it tell us about his sort of mental and creative processes that he doodles in this way? 
right? Um, there are a couple things that seem to me sort of relevant. And I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not enough of a psychologist to try to put together a real picture here. But um, first of all, uh, it is interesting to me, Thomas, exactly what you just pointed out. Um, it's fascinating that his doodles are words rather than pictures, right? Um, so he, so, so fact number one, he doesn't draw pictures and he might remember he's, he's a visual artist. He, he draws, right? It's one of the things he does, but when he doodles, he doesn't draw pictures. He writes words. That's one really interesting fact, right? Second, really interesting fact. The words that he writes are irrelevant words, right? That is to say, they're not anything connected to the story. He's not writing in Elvish, right? He's not even translating the, the headlines into Elvish, Stephen, which is, of course, a kind of thing that he might do, right? But he doesn't, he's not doing that. Um, it's totally, um, so this seems to be part of a, a completely, a completely different process, right? A completely separate mental process. He's not continuing his thoughts or, or jotting down any other ideas. Um, he's writing much more just sort of automatically. In fact, I would suspect, especially since it's copying from a newspaper that's, um, uh, that's right there. Right. Um, that suggests that he's probably not even really thinking about the content all that much. Right. But it's, um, it's forming the letters, I suspect, especially since he mentions that, uh, the script is often careful or even elaborate. It makes me think that the, just like the forming of letters. So in that sense, it's almost like drawing pictures, except it's, it's words that he's drawing pictures of. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and Timothy the third is exactly what you're saying. Why choose those things? So again, like I can, I, I feel like I can see why he would copy down totally unconnected, like totally non middle earth things, totally non Elvish or Anglo-Saxon or anything else. Right. So something utterly disconnected, uh, from his work because he's, he's clearing his mind. Right. Um, and so he clears his mind by forming letters and writing words, but he's not choosing words randomly, right? Those phrases that he has written on the back that Christopher mentions, it's not like they're just random collections of word. You know, it's not like in the front of the, or something like that, right? You know, clearly if you just, if he was just writing down the first thing his eyes alighted on for the sake of drawing letters, right? He might have totally random things, but they're not things like that, right? Um, they are names, uh, a, a bunch of names in there, like Moir River. I, that's not, that's the least surprising of all of them, right? Um, and uh, uh, in addition, um, uh, yeah, yeah, and Brian, I agree, they do seem likely to come from headlines. So he's probably just, because he's, he, he's probably not taking time to read the articles, right? But just writing down something from, from the headlines, I agree. All of those things really sound like they're, they're snippets out of, they're snippets out of headlines. Um, and I sort of wonder, you know, I can't make up my mind. Of course, I, we, we'd need a little more data than this, right? Four examples doesn't really give us enough of a scope, and we don't even know uh, that this is a full set of examples, right? We don't even know that, like, there is a... Um, it's just he wrote out many such odds and ends as, right? These are examples of the kinds of odds and ends that he wrote. Um, and these are quoted, of course, by Christopher particularly because they illustrate his point, which is the dating of this particular sheet, of this moment of outlining. Um, so it, there may be some other random scraps of text that aren't useful for dating, and so therefore uh, Christopher hasn't cited for us. So I'd need to, uh, I'd need to see more, uh, uh, more, you know, more full sheets, right, uh, in order to be able to see if, you know, to be able to draw conclusions of the, of the patterns here. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, exactly. Yana's saying maybe he was throwing Christopher a bone from the day when, uh, Christopher was going to be, uh, editing his manuscript. Well, Yana, it's hard to imagine that in 1941 and 42, when Christopher himself was off 
in South Africa, I think, by that time. Or anyways, his 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 sons were often at the war, right? So I I can't imagine that at that point he is indulging the thought too much of like, and someday, you know, fifty years from now, my son is gonna be is gonna be. Uh, uh, editing these texts and this will be useful. Um, and Nancy, you're right. He could have just written a date if that's what he had in mind. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, anyway, my, my, my question is, I wonder how much of this is purely visual. That is just these letters are the sake of him, him, uh, drawing a picture, but he's drawing, a, he's drawing the, the picture that he's drawing is words. Um, or whether he is, whether there is a pattern in the words that he chooses, whether this is him not only sort of with his hand uh, enjoying the shape of letters and the shape of words, but whether this is also with his ear enjoying the the sound of words and phrases, right? Like I said, Moir River, I can really, or Moir River, I don't know even know how you pronounce it properly or how he would have pronounced it, um, but I can easily imagine him sort of rolling the sound of that name around in his mouth, right? Um, and, uh, um, but I wonder if there's any, any imaginative content in it as well. That's another trend that I would want to look at, would be, um, has he chosen phrases because they have some kind of, I don't know, Mythic is way too grandiose, but sort of story value. See what I mean by that? Um, I mean, like, for instance, North Sea Convoy, right? And that's not, like, a mythic concept, right, of a convoy in the North Sea. And yet, that phrase by itself invites a story, right? Um, If you think about it, really, all four of those examples... Assuming you know nothing... Of, so forgetting about placing this into the actual history of World War II, right? Assume you know nothing about this. Assuming this is taking place on a foreign planet, right? Um, yet, nevertheless, all four of those phrases would kind of demand a story, wouldn't they? Um, Chinese bombers. Like, what was it about the Chinese bombers and what were they doing, right? Um, what was being convoyed in the North Sea, exactly? And what happened in this North Sea convoy, right? What's special about the Moir River and where is it? Anyway, um, I, um, I agree, Arthur, our veggie could have used a North Sea convoy. Um, uh, so yeah, exactly, Karita. I wonder how much of these phrases were chosen and just kind of lifted by him, I presume, sort of out of context. It's possible, of course, that these reflect his mind actually you know, sort of lingering on the actual news, right? The actual uh, stories from World War II. Um, you know, maybe this is him musing on, like, what's going on in the war that day. Of all of the suggestions I've made, though, that seems to me least likely, actually. It's possible, but uh, that's not the one I would expect. I could be wrong, but that's not the one I would expect. Um, but I wonder, I wonder how much his imagination was engaged and how much of it was a, a sort of more mechanical clearing of the mind uh, like doodling so often is for people. I've never been a doodler myself. I've never been somebody who draws pictures or, or writes doodling words. I have a hard time detaching my brain from what I'm writing. So doodling has never really worked for me. Um, but I don't, again, I don't, I, I, I admire it, frankly, in people who are able to uh, sort of clarify their minds and sharpen their focus through, through that kind of doodling. Um, but, uh, anyway, I, um, uh, I definitely am, would be interested to see to what extent his brain and his imagination were really engaged in these phrases that he's writing. So this would be a really cool article, right? What a, f- what a fantastic article for Tolkien studies this would be. Um, all you gotta do is um, go up to uh, uh, the Marquette, right? Go up to Marquette, uh, look at the Lord of the Rings papers, and just look at the doodles on the back of the sheets, right? And and uh, and write down all the doodles and see... Uh, what I would want to do is I'd want to write down uh, every doodle, unless there are, like, so many that they can't be written down, but I, I'd want I'd to I'd write down all the doodles and then sort of 
measure like how ornate are they, right? So you can see which ones he's kind of lingering over. There's a there's a lot there. It's total. This, this this would be a paper. This would be a cool paper, actually. Yeah, I totally, uh, I totally don't have time to write this paper, but um, uh, but. Yeah, well, James, the, the papers, the, there is going to be a big exhibition at Oxford next year of his papers, but you're not going to be able to touch them. Uh, so presumably we won't be able to flip them over and check the back, even if you go to the exhibit. So um, I don't think that's going to help. Anyway, um, but it's in but it's in Marquette. So um, I don't have time to do this. So I bequeath it to one of you. Do this. <laughs> Do this. And and let me know how it turns out. And then come and give a talk on it at uh, Myth Moot or one of our regional moots. Because I really wonder... Laura, see, look at that. It's not even far from you, right? You, you can get to Marquette, unlike many of the people listening. So yeah, Laura, totally. You should do this. Write the doodling paper, Laura. Uh, that'll be awesome. Um, uh, well, there you go. See, you even know somebody at Marquette. There you are. There it is. So, um... um uh, so yeah, did, so wouldn't this be a fun paper? Oh my goodness. Anyway, so that's why I wanted to talk about the doodling because I thought just as a concept, this was really, really cool. Apart from its obviously valuable textual dating uh, usefulness, um, I was just like, ooh, I, cause that's, he'd never even mentioned, Christopher never even mentioned that uh, Tolkien did that and that's really fascinating. But anyway, okay, okay. Um, so uh, let's go back, uh, go back to the main text now. So we're moving into this is outlining uh, for the Urukai stuff. Dusk, night, track less easy to follow. Sarn Gebir runs north south. They pass on through night, dawn on ridge. Then something the escarpment. Legolas sees eagle far away. Fangorn, rich vegetation. They see black mountains one hundred miles south. Of course, you'll remember the Black Mountains are what shall be known later as the White Mountains, right? Entwash winding. Find Orc Trail going up river. Meeting with Rohiroth. They ride to Fangorn and hear news of battle and destruction of Orcs and mysterious old man who had discomforted Orcs. They hear that no captives were rescued. Despair. Old man appears. All right, so uh, we can see, of course, some of the really basic... Uh, concepts, right? Um, uh, if, um, uh, so first of all, if, uh, that first paragraph, I think is really, is really neat, right? Dusk, night, track less easy to follow. I love the, when these outlines enable us to just kind of follow his train of thought like this. I just, I just love watching his train of thought unfolding here, right? Dusk, night track less easy to follow um as he's thinking through uh the situation there at the beginning and how this how this uh little story unfolds sarn gebir runs north south <laughs> so right. what does that tell us well that suggests right the fact that he has interjected this apparently arbitrary sarn gebir runs north south does i think tell us something right what it tells us or what i would suggest that it tells us is that Tolkien is thinking about this geographically as he's working through how this happens he's sorting out the geography in his mind right and the fact that Sarn Gebir runs north south maybe he's going to mention that in the text maybe he's not but this is clearly he needs to get his geographical parameters so that he can picture this landscape clearly uh, as they're mapping this out um uh, dawn on ridge, then something, the escarpment. Again, see, notice how he's getting the geography clear in his head here. Um, Legolas sees eagle far away. So we've got the geography unfolding, rich vegetation. Um, Black mountains, 100 miles south, Entwash winding. These are all things probably going to be picked up in visual descriptions he's going to do, right? That's because we know how much he loves doing that, painting these word pictures of, uh, of the landscape around them. Um, so that's one major trend that we see here. And, and this seems to me, uh, this outline seems to be unusually heavy with those kinds of details, with him really sorting out the geography uh, of this area as he's thinking through the story. But then there are these story elements, right? What are the chief story elements that we have? 
the persistence of the hunters. They press on through night, right? Um, so we get this this drama of them following this trail by night and and uh, uh, and untiringly. Um, we also, of course, get the story of the orcs and the defeat of the orcs and the despair, this despair of, like, were there any survivors? No, no captives were rescued. We see that's a very early element of this, uh, of this whole thing, right? So we know, we've known for a long time with the breaking of the, with the various breaking of the fellowship drafts that, um, Mary and Pippin need to get lost, right? And, uh, and they've been ending up with, Treebeard back when he was a giant uh, for some time now, uh, apart from the very brief moment when we considered chucking them into Minas Morgul instead, you may recall. Uh, but, um, but this ele- this specific element of them being pursued and then, in a sense, kind of lost again, right, um, is uh, is a new element here. But of course, over overlaying this entire story, uh, clearly. Um, and it's obviously a major focus of, in Tolkien's mind in this whole section, is Gandalf and the return of Gandalf. Um, uh, we have Legolas sees Eagle far away. Remember, in these early drafts, the Eagle is actually transporting Gandalf around, right? So when the Eagle is descending in Fangorn, that means that's Gandalf's movement. Gandalf is now that Gandalf is arriving at Fangorn as they're standing on the escarpment, seeing the Eagle go down. Um, then this mysterious old man discomfited the orcs. I'm having a hard time following the outline there in that second paragraph. Help me, help me understand this, because I'm probably being dense. Um, so they, the hunters, right, Legos, Gimli, and Aragorn, fought, find the orc trail going up the river. Um, they meet with the Rohiroth, right? So they meet with Aemir and company and his Aorid. They, meaning Aragorn, Legos Gimli, with Aemir and his company, ride to Fangorn and hear news of the battle? This is what I'm having a hard time understanding, because I can't understand it either way. If they're going with Aemir, who had the battle? If it's not Aemir, with whom did the orcs battle? Um, And if they're not riding with Aemir, if they're just going themselves then why didn't they already hear news of the battle from Amir when they when they met with the Rohiroth before? So I can't kind of see how they can both be true unless, yeah, Nancy, as you were suggesting, um, yeah, Kate, it does seem to go with the first version where they ride with Amir. Um, are we up to meet with the first marshal? You're right, Kate, I was forgetting that. So AM, so there are two groups of Rohirrim in, this, in the initial version, right? And, of course, as Nancy is reminding us, the old man, right? Um, who has played a significant role in this. So so the Gandalf story, right? The Gandalf story flown by Eagle to Fangorn in order to arrive just in time to help wreck the orcs, right? But what happened then? Did he set Merry and Pippin free? He's a mysterious old man, so he probably that probably means he disappeared after the battle. Um but so what does that mean then right does that mean that he um does it mean that he is uh um went went off with Mary and Pippin and nobody saw him or the captives so like no captives were found because Gandalf absconded with them after the battle i'm not quite sure what the um what the implication is of Gandalf's story there. Um, and, and, then, and then, of course, the old man appears. The old man appears to them, right? To the hunters. Um, so that uh, that makes that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, Kate, okay, right. The the first Aorid were under man, and so the mystery man, the, mystery, the mysterious old man must have uh, turned the tide of the battle. You've got to think, Kate, that if this is going to be how Gandalf reappears, it's going to be dramatic, right? Um, but this is interesting in itself, that the old man, um, uh, the old man is going to play an important role, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, what, play up the mystery element, 
right? Um, instead of just meeting him out of nowhere, which is what they do, thinking that he's Sar- you know that he's probably Saruman, um, they're going to play up this mysterious figure of like you know. So finding Gandalf will not just be sudden out of nowhere reunion with Gandalf. It will be the big reveal that the mysterious old man is Gandalf back from the dead, um, and that uh, that makes sense, right? Uh, uh, as a sort of a narrative trajectory, right? Keep going the outline. They think he is Saruman. Revelation of Gandalf and his account of how he escaped. He has become a white wizard. I forget most of what I knew. I was badly burned, or well burned. They go to Minas Tirith and enter in. Rest of war in which Gandalf and on his eagle in white leads assault must be told later. Partly a dream of Frodo, partly seen by him and Sam and partly heard from orcs. Frodo looks out of tower while prisoner. Okay. Um, First of all, I am still... Well, not exactly puzzled, but... um, Interested. Um, Interested in... uh, the indefinite article used for White Wizard, right? He's not the White Wizard. He's become a White Wizard. Um, And I'm still trying to figure out how that works and what that means exactly. Um, It really does start to make it sound like a rank, right? Um, Like you become a White Wizard just like you become a Black Belt. Uh, in karate or something, and and I, I don't know that that's the that that rank concept is really the the central idea here. It might be, but it might not be. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just I'm not sure that I'm really getting the way that he's talking about it here, um, and I'm still trying to figure that out because I feel like that will help me come to understand better what the final version of that means, you know, when he's, um, I am white now, Gandalf the white. What exactly is Gandalf implying by that? Uh, cause I'm not sure I've ever really totally understood that. Um, Stephen is wondering if it might be a specific role. That's a great question. Um, uh, that does kind of harken back, Stephen, to the earlier time. Remember when the wizards were first brought in? We first had Saruman and Radagast brought in. Um, it did seem to be more a question of specialization, right, rather than hierarchy uh, with the different colors. Remember how they were all gray at first? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, Stephen, I'm not sure. The only thing we knew about Saruman the White, his job was rings of power and the work of the enemy, right? So does that mean, so by becoming a white wizard, does that mean, and so he's now, a, you know, like a captain in the war against Sauron, whereas before he was a, the wandering pilgrim, Right. I'm not sure I totally understand what Gandalf's job was before exactly when he was only a gray wizard. I say only, right? Again, implying rank. Uh, I'm not really. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, yeah, um, the the being burned. Um, well burned. Several of you really like that phrase, and I certainly think that's uh, think that's that's kind of fun. Um, it's notice again he we see him once again as he so often does segueing into dialogue right this these lines of Gandalf's words sort of float into him here as he's outlining uh, I forgot most of what I knew is one and I was badly burned or I was well burned uh, and the the thing about that latter that's clearly a more jocular tone by Gandalf right I was badly burned. Um, is more dramatic, more, I don't know what, um, uh, slightly more kind of objective, right? Um, I was well burned 
is kind of inviting laughter, right? I mean, that's a that's a lighthearted way to describe it. I was well burned, right? Um, I, I I think it is kind of supposed to sound a little bit like uh, like well done, right? That kind of, but he, he's kind of joking, right? Um, yeah, but um, yes, and as as Arthur said, the burned wizard teaches best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's well done, Arthur. Um, and yes, Evan, you're right. We don't yet still clearly have a full understanding of like Gandalf as Maya yet. Um, yes, yes. Um, I agree with that. Um, Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> oh, we had the Frodo stuff. That was the other thing I wanted to come back and talk about. Um, the rest of the war in which Gandalf and... I don't understand the and slash on thing. I, I, I'm not understanding that at all. But um, which Gandalf and his eagle, Gandalf on his eagle, in white leads the assault, must be told later. Um, part of this, of course, is clearly him thinking about how the chronology lines up between the Frodo thread and the thread of the rest of them. Um, he contemplates making it a dream of Frodo's. Of course, we've seen that already several times. Um, but, the, you know, Frodo having a current events dream that would be kind of par for the course, right? That would be fairly normal. Um, the idea that Frodo could actually be an eyewitness of some of it, so some of it could be described from Frodo's perspective. This, remember, touches on old ideas. Recall that there were they were kind of aware, as they were going into Mordor in that very first Mordor outline, they were kind of aware of the battle going on over there. Remember they're hearing the horns in the hills, right? Um, and, and seeing the Nazgul, certainly. Uh, so it's kind of a it's it's kind of a return to that to think you know in that sense of making Frodo's final, the final stages of his journey more, I don't know what urgent in a sense that he can actually see and is aware the battle's going on right now right over there I better get myself to Mount Doom before it's too late, um, uh, which is very different of course from the final effect where Frodo is is really, like, totally self-contained, right? Even oblivious to the outside world until that one last final push, now, now, or it'll be too late. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I agree, Jennifer, the war for Gondor is very out of focus and secondary in these drafts. Notice also something that we... Um, uh, we almost skipped over uh, Jennifer in that regard, is that last sentence of that first paragraph. They go to Minas Tirith and enter in, right? As soon as we're reunited, you know, Aragorn and Gimli, Legolas and Gandalf, better head to Minas Tirith, right? Because that's where the battle happens. We know that's what's next. Remember, that's what, in that original one chapter, one chapter, one chapter outline, um, we got to get, you know, from the breaking of the Fellowship, get everybody doing their thing, and then get to the battle in Minas Tirith. Saruman coming from one side, uh, you know, the armies of Mordor coming from the other side, and we got to break the... And Gandalf will be involved in helping to break the siege. Here, Gandalf flying around on his eagle, right? Um, would, you know, so Gandalf as, like, you know, the air force of Minas Tirith is fairly cool, so all right. Um, Frodo can have a dream of him, and of course, if he's flying around on an eagle, uh, uh, Frodo can actually see him from his tower in Minas Morgul, so... Um, so that's cool. Last bit of the outline. Minas Tirith defeats Haredwife. They cross at Osgiliath, written above Elostirian. Defeat orcs and Nazgul. Overthrow Minas Morgul and drive forward to Dagorlad, battle plain. They get news that Ringbearer is captured. Now Treebeard. Then Frodo again. Um... I assume now Treebeard, then Frodo again. 
refers, especially then Frodo again, refers not to like the chronology of the plot, but the shape of the narrative, right? Like, so uh, after them and the battle, Treebeard is going to, he's going like, to, and now the narrative is going to shift to Treebeard, and then the, the narrative is going to shift to Frodo again. Remember, Treebeard was originally going to be involved. This is still when he's a giant, as far as we know. No reason to think of him as an ent even yet, right? Um, he's, uh, he's, he's, he was showing up at Minas Tirith, right? He was going to play the, like, Bjorn role at Minas Tirith, um, and so would presumably still be with them when they charge the Black Gate. So I assume that that's what he means when he says now Treebeard, that Treebeard's going to be doing uh, something. But, uh, but yeah, Tony, cutting between the plot threads is very much what I see him mapping out there. Um, yeah, exactly, Kate. You were thinking about the same thing with Bjorn and Treebeard fighting against Mordor. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting, though, that they're going to overthrow Minas Morgul on the way, right? Um, so it seems that they he was contemplating a series of basically three battles, right? First, the siege at Minas Tirith. Then, crossing Ados Gilead and overthrowing Minas Morgul. So, they were going to survive the siege of Minas Tirith, then they were going to go and besiege Minas Morgul and overthrow it, and then they're going to go up to the battle plain. Um... Because remember, Minas Morgul, it's not that far away, uh, but um, but those two things are, are separated. And yeah, they're going to defeat the Nazgul at Osgiliath? Or that must be... Um, I got to think, Kate, that we're defeating the Nazgul at the battle for Minas Morgul, right? Because they're the ones who control Minas Morgul. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Evan is imagining how close we could have gotten to having a having a battle between Ents and Oliphants. <laughs> That's you're right, boy. We did just narrowly miss that, Evan. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, but this this element, this element of them getting news that the ring bearer is captured. Um, Interesting that, the, and notice how this the the parallel here, the uh, despair over trying to rescue M- Mary and Pippin and thinking they're dead, as a foreshadowing of going to try to help the ring bearer and then hearing that he's been captured and is probably dead. Right, um, is a little clearer here in this outline than it is in the published text, um, because we can see those two ideas sort of emerging here at the same time. Um, Brandon, I'm wondering if this is a thought on how to get Frodo out of trouble at Minas Morgul, right? We last left Frodo in a pickle. Not really quite sure how we were going to get him the heck out of Minas Morgul, exactly. So maybe that's part of the idea here, right? I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if that was involved with this. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, Brian... Dimicus is saying, you know, that would be actually kind of a really interesting idea to have the Andorian army attack Minas Morgul while Frodo was prisoner there, um, or had just escaped. Yeah, or having him escape in the chaos, right? That would be interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Let's keep going. Some more notes about Rohan as the whole land of Rohan, which remember, this has been around now for a little while, right? He's, you know, the idea of the, the, the kingdom of the horse lords has been kind of kicking around, but he's not really done much with it yet. So we're sort of filling it out. Greyfax changed to Shadowfax. Halberat, horse of Gandalf, reappears, sent for from Rivendell. Halberat, of course, means that's one of the, it's an alternative to Shadowfax, that Halberat would be the name of Gandalf's horse meaning that we now have a definite trend. Because you'll recall, the first time Aragorn was used, it was for Gandalf's horse. So, uh, 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 you know, all of the best rangers, all the coolest rangers, used to be, you know, uh, uh, the name of Gandalf's horse before uh, uh, before they made the big time. 
Anyway, okay. Uh, Horse of Gandalf reappears, sent for from Rivendell. Arrives later. It is 500 to 600 miles from Rivendell and would take Shadowfax 10 to 14 days. Of course, we know Tolkien is always very careful about the logistics, right? So not surprising to see him thinking about the logistics of how does Gandalf get his horse again. Um, because that's obvio- uh, this is obviously a problem, right? Having him... Re- him having ridden to the north on the horse of Rohan is already an established part of the story and an important part of the story. He did not have his horse, of course, when he left with the company, so somehow we need to get him his horse again. Two, Rohiroth are relations of woodmen and Bjornings, old men of the north, but they speak Gnomish tongue of Num- Gnomish, tongue of Numenor and Ondor, as well as common tongue. So, the linguistic interest of the Rohiroth at this point is that they speak Gnomish. They speak the tongue of Numenor. Um, In other words, they are what we will later come to see in the uh, in the Rangers of Athelion. Jennifer is interested to see the the gnomes are back. Um, Well, Jennifer, he doesn't call the Noldor gnomes that much anymore. He's been dropping that, but he still thinks of the language as Gnomish. He's been calling it Gnomish for a long time, right? As the names of the language shifts around uh, a, a bit too, but Gnomish is an old uh, and to him familiar. So when he's jotting down notes to himself, I am not at all surprised to see him call the that language Gnomish still. Um... But again, so you'll remember how the Rangers of Athelion, right, are, you know, uh, uh, Frodo is struck by the fact that these are men, and yet they are speaking Elvish, right? Um, you know, it takes him a while to realize that they're speaking in the Elvish tongue. That kind of thing is what he was going to give to the Rohiroth originally. So he's having the Rohiroth much more explicitly connected to Numenor, which, given what we learned, remember, about Aragorn and his history and the history of the Numenorians in Ondor, that makes that particularly interesting, doesn't it? Does this mean that the Rohiroth are, what, relative of, of the Dúnedain? Is Aragorn closer in kinship with the Rohiroth than he is with the people of Gondor, who are the survivors of the folk who booted out the Numenorians? Right? I think uh, we haven't seen him explicitly reject that concept of the Andorians kicking out the Numenorians. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's an interesting impulse there, which has more than linguistic implications. Trotter should know Eamir. Okay, so the two of them should already be acquainted. Marhad Marhoth is second master. Remember, instead of marshals, we have masters, right? And we don't have a king in Rohan. We just have the first master. So we have the first master, second master, third master. Eomir is the third master. And Marhad, Marhath. And then, of course, he writes in the margin, Marhad, Marhath, Marhelm, Marhun, Marhi, Marhiz, Marolf. Uh, we see him toying with all of these different versions of the name. Eowyn Elfsheen, daughter of Eamond. Question mark. Uh, Elf Sheen, of course, is uh, yeah. Tony, great point. Tony says once he starts naming the people of Rohan, it's immediately in Anglo-Saxon. Yes, Marhad, Marhath, Marhelm, Marolf. Yep, yep, absolutely. And Eomir, not to mention, right? Exactly, Eowyn, um, Eomund. Yes, he goes to the Anglo-Saxon names even though he was thinking in a, new, in a Numenorean direction for them, right? Um, so that is kind of fascinating. Um, and yes, Elfsheen, like like um, um, like Morwen, yeah, exactly, Morwen, Elethwin, Elfsheen, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Who is the most beautiful of mortal women? Um, which tells you something about, it gives us a little bit of a hint about his intentions towards Eowyn. Tolkien's intentions, I mean, towards Eowyn, right? Um, if he's going to name her Elf Sheen, it's one thing to say that Eowyn's kind of cute. It's another thing to name her Elf Sheen, right? And to recall Morwen. And of course, recalling Morwen does much more than just say she's awful pretty, 
right? Uh, as there are lots of things uh, that are associated with Morrowind. Pride, James, I agree, is one. Um, uh, but of course also suffering and tragedy. Uh, so all kinds of that connection, and we don't know exactly what he's trying to establish through that connection, but it's a, it's a really inviting, it's a really interesting connection that he's making there. On the back of this page is very rough drafting for the conversation with Aemir, but there is also, but there, but there is also here the note, Eowyn Elfsheen, daughter of Theoden. Okay, so considering making her Theoden's daughter, considering her making her Aemon's daughter. Um, yeah, Brianna says she can see Morwen slaying the Witch King. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, goodness. Brian, I can see Morwen cowing the Witch King, right? Morwen's scary. Uh, uh, Morwen is, uh, uh, she's, uh, she is a strong woman. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and Yana, I, I agree. Interesting, and it's important even just to observe that, um, Eowyn is being given an elvish connection here, even if just in her name, right? Okay. The origins and loyalties of the Horse Masters. Okay. Uh, in both we may prove their equals, said Gimli, but on foot we cannot hope to overtake their start unless they are hindered. Right, he's talking about, of course, obviously the orcs. Um, and, uh, you know, being, being, uh, uh, I forget the two things that are in which he's going to prove, they're going to prove, but like endurance and determination, that, that kind of thing. I know it, said Aragorn. Yet follow we must as best we can, and may be that better f- and may be that better fortune awaits us if we come down into Rohan. But I do not know what has happened in that land in late years, nor of what mind the horse masters may be may now be between the traitor Saruman and the threat of Sauron. They have long been friends with the people of Ondor and the lords of Minas Tirith, though they are not akin to them. After the fall of Isildur, they came out of the north beyond Mirkwood and their kinship is rather with the Brandings, the men of Dale, and with the Bjornings of the woods, among whom still may be seen many men tall and fair like the riders of Rohan. At the least, they will not love the orcs, or aid them willingly. Does this suggest, in the way that he expounds on this, that they are, that he's changed his linguistic concept there? I'm not sure. To me, it's interesting, you know, and I didn't even talk about it at the time, but the fact that he, he... does both things, that he makes them A, connected with the men of Dale and with the Bjornings, but also B, Numenorian, right? Uh, speaking the Numenorian language. That's a really interesting mashup to me, because there was nothing really to connect either the Bjornings or the men of Dale with the Numenorians. Now, of course, prior to this moment, I don't think we've had any indication of the history of the men of Dale or of the Bjornings, right? Um, because we only know about them from The Hobbit. And that was before these things were all connected. The firewall hadn't come down yet. Um, yeah. Um, Tony, I don't know if this is the first mention of the concept of a common tongue. I don't remember it coming up, but it may just not have been emphasized. I can't remember for sure. The question of where their loyalties lie. One thing that's very clear, they are much more free agents here, right? They, are, they have long been friends with the people of Andor, but there doesn't seem to be any overt political allegiance between the two of them, right? Um, there does not seem to be an oath of Kyrian and Aeoral, and Aeoral floating in the air here. Um, the people of Andor have reason, have historical reason to think they would be friendly or well disposed towards them. But this means that the question of do they serve Saruman or do they serve Sauron now is a more open question, right? Um, And we can see, um, uh, we can see uh, uh, Aragorn being, or Trotter. No, he's Aragorn already. Again, I should say. Um, 
uh, I, I think we can hear more certain doubt, right? Uh, remember in the published text, Boromir speaks strongly against that in the in the council, right? In the council of Elrond, because of the 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 relationship, the very positive relationship uh, in both senses between um, between Gondor and Rohan. Um, so he vouches for the Rohirrim and says that that's totally not true. Aragorn also says he didn't believe that report, doesn't believe that report any more than Boromir did, right? So he also is dismissive of it. He's not dismissive of this concept here at all. It's definitely, it's definitely on the table uh, in uh, this early draft. So this is virtually the text of the two towers, and it is curious to see what its meaning was when it was first written, that Gandalf was passing high above their heads. So this is, of course, the text about how uh, um, when Legos is spying the eagle, right? Uh, the eagle was flying to Fangorn, and therefore northwest rather than north, whereas in the two towers Gandalf explains later to Legolas that he had sent the eagle, Gwaihir the Windlord, to watch the river and gather tidings. Gwaihir had told him of the captivity of Merry and Pippin. Against the suggestion here that the eagle was carrying Gandalf from Tall Brandir, where he resisted the eye and saved Frodo, my father wrote NO in large letters. Uh... Uh, uh, CF Two Towers, I sat on a high place and strove with the Dark Tower, and the shadow passed. Uh, nonetheless, he preserved the new text, right? Of course, Tolkien totally changed the idea, but kept the text that he had written, right? Classic. Just classic. Um, he, you know, never throw anything away if you can, uh, if you can reuse it or recycle it. Um, so, one impulse that we can see here is Tolkien's initial impulse to use the eagles more, to make the eagle into Gandalf's mount. We saw that in the outline, and we can see it coming in here, how Gandalf was going to be in there at Tol Brandir, nearby where Frodo was on Amonhen, and taking an active role in shielding him uh, from nearby, right? And then Gandalf's going to come and get dropped off uh, at Fangorn. Uh, so that's uh, interesting to see Tolkien's impulse to sort of pull back on the eagles, right? We're not going to get Gandalf the, the White flying on the back of an eagle in the battle uh, anymore, of course. Aragorn turned the brooch over. The underside of the leaf was of silver. It is freshly marked, he said. With some pin or sharp point, it has been scored. See? A hand has scratched on it. The others looked at the faint letters eagerly. They were both alive then so far, said Gimli. That is heartening. We do not pursue in vain. And one at least had a hand free. That is strange, and perhaps hopeful. Um, really interesting um, that uh, um, really interesting that the first impulse with the sign is to make it more clear. That it, so, one thing that I already found striking before we got to this point is that we get less of Aragorn's woodcraftiness, less we, um, notably absent from the immediate post-breaking of the Fellowship scene, is the need to do interpretation of signs, right? Figure out what happened, and who went where, and what they should do. There's some of that implied, but that, that happens much, much less, right? And then similarly, when we get the uh, when we get the, 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 the pin, right, the brooch, uh, fallen onto the grass, it too is made more explicit. It needs less interpretation, right? He's actually written on it. Um, he, they don't have to guess, did Mary, or wonder, did both Mary and Pippin survive? Because he writes, right, M and P on it. He signs it. Um, and Kimber, you're right. There, it, This is similar, um, uh, uh, Pippin is using a very similar technique to what Gandalf used on Weathertop uh, in uh, in making signs. So I agree, it fits in with what we've seen. Um, but uh, uh, but anyway, I, it's definitely um, this. Again, okay, the initial impulse is to make the signs more clear, more obvious, right? Um, and by the way, can I just point out that one? I didn't quote it because it's, it's not worth reading the whole passage in detail, but when Christopher Tolkien mentioned, like, uh, as an aside, that the published text of the Two Towers contains an error that was never caught, um, when Aragorn says 
of Pippin. He was smaller than the other. Um, that always sounded so weird. Like why, why would he refer to Mary as the other, right? Kind of like the, for Lotro players, kind of like the, uh, uh, the Boromir session play, right? Um, for those of you who don't play. So, um, in the game, you do the, you play out the breaking of the fellowship from, from Boromir's perspective. Right. And in the game, of course, the, uh, all characters have, have names floating above their head, right. When you click on them, um, so you can identify them, right? But they change the names when it's told from Boromir's perspective. Uh, and uh, instead of having their names, like above Legolas, it just says the elf, and above Gimli, it just says the dwarf. Um, and uh, uh, above Merry and Pippin, it just says, like, the other hobbit, and that other hobbit. <laughs> you know, it, just, it doesn't give their names. Now, that's a little unkind to Boromir. I can't help but think. I always thought that... I find that session play really funny, though I think it goes a little bit too far. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, I... Uh, um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that it sounds weird in the text when Aragorn says he's shorter than the other. Um, and for Christopher to say... No, the actual reading, what Tolkien actually wrote was, he is shorter than the others, plural, all three of the others. He is the shortest of the four, right? That makes all kinds... That sounds like something that Aragorn would say. So that um, that really um, set my set my mind at ease, actually, because uh, that passage had, had bothered me uh, for many, many years. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, okay. Uh... Yeah, and interesting that the brooches first get invented, right, when there's a need for a sign. Um, but that itself is kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, it's one thing to say, well, it makes sense, right, that he invents the bro- he invents the brooch when we need something to cast away. But they had lots of other things they could have cast away, right? Um, isn't it interesting that he reached for an elvish thing? to cast away, not just Pippin reaching for it, but that Tolkien, when he had to invent an artifact, something, some sign for Pippin to be able to leave, he invented the the beautifully carved leaf brooch or pin uh, that is attaching the, the cloak. Um, he didn't have to do that, right? I, I mean, if Pippin wanted to uh, make us, he could have, like, thrown his, thrown his, his pipe, right? Um, it could have been his, or something, right? It could have been a hobbity thing that he threw. It could have been his tobacco pouch or something. Um, why wasn't it, right? Why, why instead reach for, um, why instead reach for an elvish thing? Um, that is, um, that is interesting to me. Um, yeah, and Kate, you're right, something which would otherwise be cherished. Remember, Kate, that's, of course, already the theme, right? That, like, uh, th- this prompts Aragorn to say, he who will not cast a tre- who who cannot cast away a treasure at need is in fetters, right? Um, the same would be true of any of his hobbit treasures, right? Like, you know, that he keeps, you know, dearer than rings to him, right? His pipe and his spare pipe. I'm thinking, of course, of from the published text by uh, in the Flotsam and Jetsam chapter. Um so it totally could be right uh something but um um yeah i mean i agree thomas they already had the cloaks so sure i mean i i, I am not questioning like i'm not saying i think it's a bad idea or anything i'm just saying i think it's interesting um why an elvish sign why an elvish treasure does it say something about Pippin, right? That he would rather throw away the piece of jewel, the valuable piece of jewelry that he got from the elf queen than his pipe or something like that, right? Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's just a utility thing, a thing that's right there on the outside of his clothes that he can catch and throw away. But no, that doesn't seem to work because he has enough time to break off the pin and carve on it. So presumably he could have had time to fish in his pockets and get whatever it was he wanted. Um, so, uh, Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I think I think that um, I'm not sure what to do with that. I'm sure what 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 conclusion to draw from that. Um, whether in this 
what we're seeing here is another sort of instance of the increasing influence of the Elvish stuff and of Galadriel, thinking back, of course, to the making of the cloaks, magic cloaks, when Frodo needs stealth in Minas Morgul, right? Um, that's when the idea of the magic of the cloaks, of the virtue of the cloaks, uh, you know, sort of came to him. Um, and the, and by doing so, by doing that and by doing this, we have the the influence of Lothlorien and of Galadriel sort of growing and spreading through the story. Um, yeah. Um... Yeah, Carita says the elvish things have virtues, like being seen or unseen at need. Yeah. And that's, again, Carita, another really interesting point here. Does that suggest that that's why Pippin chose it, right? Pippin chose it because he thought it more likely to work, right? Carita, of course, the other thing that that makes me think of is remember the elf stone that Glorfindel leaves as a sign on the bridge, Right? Did that happen yet? In the latest drafts that we got? I can't remember. Somebody looked that up. Did we get the elf stone? Did Gorfinda leave an elf stone? Uh, a barrel in the bridge? In the most recent version of our trip to Rivendell? Somebody looked that up for me and let me know if that happened. Um, yeah, oh, and good. Uh, Xenia was just saying the same thing about uh, the uh, the virtue of the elvish thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, but see, Thomas, it has to be something unique so it can be used to identify them. But something hobbity would be even more unique, right? Like, they all share the brooches. He could have thrown away something that they would have known to be Pippin's, right? Um, because I bet you that Aragorn and Gimli would recognize Pippin's pipe, right? If you throw it, they'd be like, oh, this is Pippin's pipe. Aragorn would, 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 would notice that, right? So the brooch, that all of them have identical brooches, as far as we know, right? Um, I mean, they would recognize it as clearly belonging to the hobbits, but it seems to me actually one of the least distinctive possible things in that sense. That is, yes, it distinguishes the fellowship from among everybody else, but that's not the point, right? Um, anyway. Uh... Ah, good. Yes, James, thank you. Yes, on page 59, Trotter finds the stone on the last bridge. Awesome. So it could be picking up on that as well. So this could be uh, a sort of retroactive transformation of that into uh, uh, foreshadowing, essentially, that he's doing like, you know, so Pippin is doing like Glorfindel did, in a sense. I kind of like that, actually. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. No, Rebecca, he totally has his pipe with him. Yeah, he uh, absolutely has his pipe. Uh, his pipe and a pocket full of Lembas, so uh, he totally he totally would have it with him. Um, you're right, Kate. The fact that the brooch comes with the pin, if we're breaking off the pin and using it to scratch on it, it does, uh, uh, it does combine in that sense the stone on the bridge, the elf stone on the bridge, with uh, the markings of Gandalf on Weathertop. So I guess it is a more like, all-purpose utility item there, but I'm not sure that I think that those kinds of pra pragmatic concerns are the only sort of issues here, but, um, yeah, anyway, um, let's keep going. Gandalf, said Amir, we have heard of him. An old man of that name used to appear at times in our land. None knew whence he came or where he went. His coming was ever the herald of strange events. Indeed, since his last coming, all things have gone amiss. Our trouble with Saruman began from that time. Until then, we had counted Saruman our friend. But Gandalf said that evil was afoot in Isengard. Indeed, he declared that he had been a prisoner in Orthanc and had escaped, riding on an eagle. Nonetheless, he asked us for a horse. What arts he used, I cannot guess, but Theoden gave him one of the Mayaris, the steeds that only the first master of the Mark may ride. For it is said that they are descended from the horses which the men of Westerness brought over the great seas, changed to, it is said their sires came out of the lost land over the great sea when the kings of men came out of the deeps of Gondor. Out of the deeps to Gondor. Shadowfax was the name of that horse. We wondered if evil had befallen the old man, for seven nights ago Shadowfax returned. Okay. Um, 
first, remember Christopher's note that although Gondor appears here in the text, Christopher is not at all certain that this means that Andor has officially and finally become on Gondor, um, because in the Treebeard chapter, which comes next, it still talks about Andor in the initial draft, so it seems possible that came out of the deeps to Gondor. Possibly even this whole correction here, this whole change to their sires came out of the lost land over the great sea when the kings of men came out of the deeps to Gondor is probably is likely under a later alteration. So, um, uh, yes, Nancy, isn't it cool to think that this, the initial thought, the initial implication, at least Amir's interpretation is that Gandalf is doing the worm tongue thing. There is no worm tongue yet, right? The worm tongue story, there's no hint yet of the worm tongue story. Instead, we just get this random old guy who apparently can talk Theoden out of doing, into doing anything, right? I mean, he gets him to give up one of the Mayaris. That's, uh, that's crazy. Um, notice how much more sketchy a figure Gandalf is, and I don't mean ill-sketched, right? I mean dubious, right? He's a much more, uh, uh, much more questionable, uh, figure. Amir doesn't say he's a wizard, right? Or that he's heard that he's a wizard. He's just this old dude. And weirdness follows this old dude around, right? He was ever the herald of strange events. When this old dude comes around, weird stuff starts happening, right? Including, for instance, war with Saruman of late. So that's been kind of a bummer. And Yana, he does seem to be much less known all around. Yeah. And don't forget, so is Aragorn, right? He's never been to Othlorien before. So that seems to be a bit of a trend, having both Gandalf and Aragorn be comparative strangers uh, in the world as a whole here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... Jennifer, yes, this does sound a little bit more like the tricky, troublemaking Gandalf of The Hobbit. Remember, Jennifer, the, those references in... I, mean, I can tell you are remembering those references in Chapter 1, right? Stories just spring up out of the grass when Gandalf comes around, right? Um, if you knew a quarter of what I knew about Gandalf, you would be ready for any sort of tale, right? We get in Chapter 1 of The Hobbit. Um, that's the role he seems to have in Rohan, right? Whenever this little old man comes around Rohan, expect stories to start happening, right? Um, but Brandon and I agree. We stop well short of Gandalf Stormcrow, right? We stop... Uh, he's not... Um, uh, he is not yet a herald of woe, just a herald of strange events. And Amir Brandon, as you point out, does seem to be genuinely concerned about um, Gandalf's well-being here. Um, yeah, so I, it is fascinating that this glimpse of Gandalf that we get from Amir um, does seem to be a much, an older kind of Gandalf, which is interesting, right? That, that this seems to be looking back more towards the Hobbit kind of conception because we're talking about, re, you know, uh, resurrected Gandalf here. We're talking about the, you know, the, the, the new Gandalf um, not just new in the sense of how Gandalf himself, all versions of Gandalf's character are growing over time, but he's now a white wizard, right? Um, I wonder if it's designed to set up that as a contrast, right? That the, um, the role that he has played in Rohan in the past has been a, uh, a hobbit kind of, you know, a the hobbit kind of role. But now he's going to be now he's a white wizard, which means he's going to come in and he's going to be leading the troops into battle and and that kind of thing. Right. He used to come and deliver messages. Right. Like beware of Isengard. Saruman's tr actually a bad guy. Right. And ever since then, they've had war. Right. Now he's going to be coming in, flying on the backs of eagles, and kicking butt. Right. Um, but he was always riding one of the Mayaris, which just seemed like a swindle to Amir at the time. Okay. I liked the first version of Amir's um, 
Marvel's speech. It is hard to be sure of anything among so many Marvels. One may pardon Aethine, my squire. The world is all turned strange. Old men upon eagles, and raiment that deceives the eye, and elves with bows, and folk that have spoken with the Lady of the Wood and yet live, and the sword comes back to war that was broken ere the fathers of the fathers rode into the mark. How shall a man judge what to do in such times? It is against our law to let strangers wander free in our land, and doubly so at this time of peril. I beg you to come back honorably with me, and you will not. Um, his characterization of the marvels I found striking, right? First of all, old men upon eagles, right? That's Of course, that one stays true, even if uh, even when Gandalf stops using uh, Gwaihir as a taxi service, he still does get a ride to Rohan on the eagle from Orthanc, right? So um, there would be a there would be a reason to associate it there. Um, elves with bows, the sword capital S comes back to war, or the fathers capital F of the fathers capital F rode into the mark. Um, his list is um, a little bit fuller, and. Uh, what it makes me think of, especially in light of what we were just talking about, um, it sounds a little bit more to me like the list of things in back to chapter one of The Hobbit and Gandalf causing adventures, right? Um, uh, you know, the, the list of, of the kinds of adventures that Gandalf had been responsible for in times past and that kind of thing. Um, Brandon and I agree that elves with bows sound a little bit strange. I mean, as a member of the list, right? Like, why is that weird? Why is that a marvel? Well, just seeing elves at all, right, is uh, is a marvel. My suspicion, Brandon, is that what Aemir means when he says elves with bows is not like, seeing an elf is one thing, but seeing an elf with a bow blows my mind, right? I can't think that that's what Aemir means. What I think he probably means is, like... Here's an elf with a bow. Of course elves have bows, right? But here's an elf with a bow, like right here. Like so the, the the thing is that it's like the story come to life. They probably have read have stories about elves with bows, right? And here is one. Like would you would, would you look at that? There's an elf and he's even got a bow, right? Just like the stories that I always used to hear. Um it's just exactly what Kimber was saying, that it sounds like he's referencing legends or old stories. Um Raiment that deceives the eye. Yeah, like in old some old stories or fairy tales about magic cloaks, right? Um, uh, you know, the hobbits seem to have heard stories about magic cloaks, too, which is why they ask the elves, right? Are these magic cloaks? Uh, just like in those stories we've read. Um, and then we, we, we move, and it's, uh, it's the Lady of the Wood, primarily, who seems to transition us into these larger, more mythic concepts with the capital letters, right? The sword comes back to war. The fathers of the fathers. Um, yeah. It's, I, I, I like how we get this sense of stories coming to life. And again, it reminded me, even before we were talking, I wasn't thinking about that with the Gandalf stuff that you guys were just talking about. That You know, Jennifer, the connection you were making back to chapter one of The Hobbit. And I love that. Um, because I was thinking of that here, right? That this sounded like this th this idea of, like, stories, the way that Bilbo is overwhelmed at the idea of these kinds of stories coming into life. All right, let's talk about Fangorn. I do not know what fables men have made out of old knowledge, said Aragorn, and of the truth little is now known, even to Celeborn. Uh, this is, of course, in relation to the warning that Celeborn gave them about Fangorn, you know, that Gimli is reminding him that Celeborn warned them against him. But I have heard tell that in Fangorn, clinging here on the east side of the last slopes of the Misty Mountains, the ancient trees have taken refuge that once marched dark and proud over the wide lands, before even the first elves awoke in the world. Between the Baranduin and the Barrow Downs is another forest of old trees, but it is not as great as Fangorn. Some say that both are but the last strongholds of one mighty wood, more vast than Mirkwood the Great, that held under its dominion all the countries through which now flow the Grey Flood and the Baranduin. Others say that Fangorn is not akin to the old forest, and that its secret is of another kind. 
Okay, so first of all, I think we have to be careful not to get ahead of ourselves. Still, it would be just a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, uh, I think that uh, the ancient trees have taken refuge that once marched dark and proud over the wide lands is not a sentence about who warns and trees walking. This is not a walking tree sentence, I don't think. Um, the way that Tolkien uses the word marched in this context, that it marched with or marched across or marched over, means this is what its boundaries were. Like, it extended over this period. Um, uh, this is not him talking about trees marching, specifically. That is, walking. Um, that's it, It's like... It's like the way he uses the verb fly, usually, you know, unless he's talking about birds or some obviously uh, uh, winged thing, he, he's, he, he's, he uses the word fly to say run away, uh, to mean run away. So, too, when he uses the word march in this way, uh, talking about the extent of their domain, it means their, uh, their borders. Exactly, Brandon, like the East March is a place in the same sense as March Wardens, Jennifer. Yes, exactly. Um you can even use the phrase this country marched with this other country, meaning it shared a boundary with them. Um, so that's, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing. So when he talks about, um, marching dark and proud over the wide lands, he's talking about the extent of their boundaries, right? It was huge is what he means. Though it's really tempting, right? It's really tempting to look at this as, the, uh, and, and um, to be imagining who warns and say, Hey, we're there. But we're actually getting there, aren't we? That hint in the last sentence. Others say that Fangorn is not akin to the old forest, and that its secret is of another kind. Oh, so there is a secret in Fangorn. That seems to me to be the first. As far as I can see, that sentence right there is our first indicator of real ends, right? That the concept of the giant tree beard has changed. Because and this is and 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 about time too, as we're just about to enter the tree beard chapter there. So that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, exactly, uh, Evan. I think we're we're not making any jabs, uh, uh, any Macbeth jabs yet. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Here's the outline of the. Uh, of the orc chapter that is from the orc's point of view, not just, so, so we've, we've done the hunters. Now the uruk chapter. Some want to go north. Some say ought to go straight to Mordor. The great orcs were ordered to go to Isengard. They carry prisoners. Neither of them are the one. They haven't got it. Kill them. But they're hobbits. Saruman said bring any hobbit alive. Curse Saruman. Who does he think he is? A good master and lord, man's flesh to eat. So again, we can see outline turning into dialogue here, right? Kill him, we're even speaking in uh, orc-like language here. Um, but uh, anyway, um, notice one major story point here, right? Um, the concept of the orcs all know about the ring the, uh, about the ring bearer right this is still public knowledge among the orcs just like it was in Minas Morgul right um, and that's still in place that's still that's still on the way apparently they haven't got it they just know I guess they search them to see if they have the ring of power right and so they want to kill them because they're hot. They may be hobbits, but they're not the ring bearers. So that shifts things from the published text, but is consistent with what we've seen. Fight breaks out. Slain orc falls on top of Pippin with blade drawn. Pippin manages to cut wristbands, ties cord loosely again. Isengarders win. Mordor orcs are killed. They start on. Leader called Ugluk leaves them. They rouse Mary, give him drink, cut ankle bonds, and drive hobbits with whips. Dark night. Pippin manages to unclasp brooch unseen. They get into plane. Mary and Pippin made to run till they faint and fall. Orcs carry them. Pippin awakes to hear horsemen. 
Night. Terror of orcs. They run at great speed. Ugluk refuses to let hobbits be slain or cast aside. They get into plain. Merry and Pippin made to run till they faint and fall. Orcs carry them. Pippin awakes to hear horsemen. Night. Terror of orcs. They run at great speed. U- oh, sorry, I already said that. Ugluk refuses to let hobbits be slain or cast aside. Sorry. Horsemen ride up. Ugluk steals off from his friends seizing hobbits. But a horseman rides after him. Pippin pulls Merry down flat and covers him with a cloak. Uh, the horseman rides past and spears Ugluk. Merry and Pippin fly into the forest. And then Christopher says, Ugluk is here, of course, the Mordor orc, subsequently called Grishnak. Um, I'm not sure I agree with Christopher's reading here. Um, I hate calling Christopher on something like this because when it's something this simple, he's usually right and I'm wrong. Um, he doesn't usually make mistakes like this. But I don't get that reading. Ugluk's name is used twice, right? Um, uh, that is the first... Um, the first time is Isengarders win, Mordor orcs are killed, they start on. Leader called Ugluk leaves them, but he, he's, he's guessing at the word leaves, right? It might not be leaves. Um, if it's leaves them, I mean, I can see how here he's thinking he, like Grishnak leaves initially, right? And then Grishnak comes back later on. Um, but maybe it's not leaves. Because what's much clearer to me is that it's Ugluk who's refusing to let the hobbits be slain or cast aside. And that was the Isengarder position. The Isengarders won the debate, right? The Mordor orcs wanted to kill the hobbits. The Isengarders wanted to keep them safe for Saruman, right? Because following Saruman's orders, um, that they were to bring back all, any hobbit alive. Um, so, anyway, um, he, that the Mordor orc would be refusing to let the hobbits be slain or cast aside seems strange. It's not impossible. But it seems strange to me. Um, it's like one of two things, right? Either this is the Grishnak character who is being who is initially named Ugluk, or that the role of orc who carries Merry and Pippin out of the camp and is killed and they're set free was Ugluk instead of the Grishnak character. Um, either one of those things seems to me quite possible. Um, the thing that's hardest to me, like, the, no Mordor orc, the Mordor orcs have lost, right? So how could one of the Mordor orcs be refusing to let the Isengarders kill or cast aside the hobbits, besides which, why would they want to? They were the ones who were fighting to keep them alive in the first place. So, myself, when I read this outline, I think Ugluk is already Ugluk. I think he's the leader of the Isengarders. It's just that he's the one who's trying... We have him sneaking out, trying to sneak out on his own with the captives and being caught there at the end. Um, That would be my reading of this. But, again, you know, Christopher's probably right and I'm probably wrong. Um, Segwaying into Treebeard here. My father said years later, letter number 180, uh, in 1956... I have long ceased to invent. I wait till I seem to know what really happened, or till it writes itself. Thus, though I knew for years that Frodo would run into a tree adventure somewhere far down the great river, I have no recollection of inventing Ents. I came at last to the point, and wrote the Treebeard chapter without any recollection of previous thought, just as it now is. Right? And of course, as Christopher Tolkien says, that's almost exactly what we see. There are a couple places where we see him reviving, uh, revising rather, but the whole not just the not just the story, right? Not just the narr- not just the plot, but the words, right? And the concept of Ents all just comes out, right? Is uh, is discovered uh, by Tolkien instead of being invented by Tolkien, um, and that's pretty awesome. Right. Uh, 
thinking of where Treebeard was, right? Thinking of Treebeard the giant. Um, this discovery of Tolkien's, I think, is made all the more remarkable by the fact that in order to discover that the the real so like what really happened with Treebeard was not that he was a giant like a Jack and the Beanstalk giant who is uh, lives in a forest right and is called a tree man because he's as tall as a tree and has the reputation of being mean and ferocious as giants are almost certain to have except he turns out to be not so bad right turns out to be kind of friendly and will end up coming and helping them in some helping the good guys right in some significantly you catastrophic way later on in the story. That was the original Treebeard story that he had, right? And that's appealing in a lot of ways, especially since it's... Giants are a major part of traditional folklore, especially in England. Um, I mean, Jack the Giant Killer is one of the favorite fairy tales of the, of the English tradition. Um, so to turn away from that and to this wholly new conception in this, you know, quick and apparently spontaneous way is, uh, is really interesting, right? And really shed some light on this, this idea of Tolkien discovering things, right? Um, not inventing, but, uh, but discovering, um, Yeah, Jennifer says, maybe this is why it took him so long to finish writing things. New stuff pops up, which means having to go back and revise the old stuff, and then new, new stuff pops up. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, you know what I... Um, there's a phrase in Leaf by Niggle, which is, of course, like fairly autobiographical anyway. Um, but there's a, there's a particular phrase that he uses in Leaf by Niggle that, that I always think of when I think of that stuff. I think of his old, like this process, right? Christopher, of course, told the story in this chapter about how he, or actually in the previous chapter, about how he had had to change the chronology, right? Because the chronologies weren't matching up, so he had to add an extra day. And how, you know, uh, Christopher quotes Tolkien's letter to him, to Christopher, about how much effort it took, how he wanted to go on with the story, but he ended up spending all this time going back and adjusting all the, on all, all that stuff. Um, anyway, the phrase in Leaf by Nickel that I'm thinking of is when he he's talking about the tree when Nickel starts painting the tree um, and how Nickel keeps discovering the stuff about the tree um, and how he keeps discovering things and the, the phrases that have to be attended to, right? Like he's distracted by this other thing. So birds come flying in and have to be attended to, Um He's in the middle of painting this branch over here, right? But then all of a sudden, he discovers there's a bird over there. So he's got he's to go and he's got to paint the bird, but he's still, he's left this other branch. So, I, I, so Jennifer, I do think that that does seem to be involved, right? That this process of discovery leads him to be kind of going here and there and changing things and, and, and realizing um, that he's got it. Because there are two things at work, right, in Tolkien. One is this discovery thing. But the other is the fact that he is really meticulous, right? He can't he can't do the C.S. Lewis thing. He can't do the Narnia hodgepodge thing. And please understand me, I'm not insulting Narnia. Huge C.S. Lewis fan. But this is one of the things that really annoyed Tolkien about Narnia, right? Is that C.S. Lewis is, is willing to just kind of chuck the, the kitchen sink, mythologically speaking, into Narnia, right? Um, when C.S. Lewis discovers that, you know, Father Christmas lives in Narnia, he's fine with that, right? Uh, he can mix talking animals and Greek fauns and Norse dwarfs and uh, Father Christmas all into one happy, you know, stew there uh, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Tolkien, Tolkien don't play like that, right? He can't do that. So he has this... He's making all these discoveries and he's attending to all these things as they're coming in. But yeah, Jennifer, then he's got to sit down and be like, okay, but, but now I've got to make it all work right now. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to bring it all together. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And yes, Yana, I agree. It really is remarkable that he ever published anything during his lifetime, given this tendency. I'm telling you, one of the things that studying the history of the Lord of the Rings, the history of, not just the history of the Lord of the Rings, the whole history of Middle-earth, one of the things that I come back to, one of the biggest picture things, what a miracle it was the Lord of the Rings ever got finished. You know, it's one of those things that, like, in retrospect, it's hard to imagine. How, how did he finish the Lord of the Rings? How could this man, right? When you look at the Silmarillion and the evolution of the Silmarillion over time, like, how did that man finish the Lord of the Rings? It's unbelievable. Um, I mean, I'm glad he did and everything, don't get me wrong. But yes, it really kind of helps you to appreciate what a, uh, you know, what a special special grace he received uh, to finish the Lord of the Rings there. Um, yeah, and Sharon, I think that that's a really good point. Um, uh, Sharon says it gives it gives her more understanding why Tolkien never answered the question of where the Entwives went, right? Because he 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 didn't know. Um, I agree. He says that. That's what he says in letters. You know, he says, I, I, I don't know. Um, and you know, a lot of people read that and sort of assume he's being coy, right? But no, he means it quite literally. He never discovered where the Anton wives went, right? And he's not going to be untrue to this. I mean, that's is how he works, right? He doesn't know the answer. He's not gonna. He's not gonna make it up. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyway. Um. But see, this is certainly, I think, one of the most fun moments of this, you know, one of the most, one of the clearest illustrations of this whole discovery thing was his discovery of the ants. Um, here's his outline. Did first Lord of the Elves make tree folk in order to, or through, trying to understand trees? Of course. Of course. It's a language thing, Right. Of course, that's where ants came from, naturally. Um, by the way, you see the difference between tree folk and tree men, right? Tree men are men the size of trees, right? Um, tree folk are different, are very different. Um, Gimli and Legolas to go with Trotter and Boromir. It must be Merry and Pippin who find Gandalf. So, Christopher Tolkien, in commenting on this uh, outline, opines that the first part of this outline was written prior to the latest version of the Breaking of the Fellowship, when Boromir dies, right? Um, I'm... maybe that's possible, but I'm not totally convinced that that's true, as we'll see as we move forward. Um... But remember, of course, this is important because Gimli and Legolas were the ones originally who first met Gandalf. Remember, they're heading back up north, they're going home, uh, and they run into the resurrected white Gandalf, and, uh, and, and he turns them back around and brings them down to find Trotter and Boromir, who have gone on to Minas Tirith. Um, so this outline is saying that's not going to happen. It's not going to be Legolas and Gimli who, meet, who discover Gandalf. They're going to stay with Trotter and Boromir, Merry and Pippin, therefore, have to be the ones who find Gandalf first. Notes for Treebeard. In some ways rather stupid, are the tree folk lone walkers now that have gone tree-like, or trees that have become now? One, Treebeard might be move. Oh, sorry, that's a footnote. Treebeard might be moveless, but here are some notes or suggestions, or first suggestions. Um, so, now, of course, those of you who are C.S. Lewis fans, uh, well, no, this is a very useful word that Lewis invented, uh, in Out of the Silent Planet, which, uh, obviously Tolkien knew. Of course, you can read in his letters, uh, the long letter he wrote commending it to, uh, uh to his publisher to try to get, help C.S. Lewis get it published. Um, in Out of the Silent Planet, this distinction, now is a very, very useful word, um, Oh my goodness. 
This answers a question that I have had for a long time. Anyway, sorry. Sorry. Um, now. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I'm just realizing how the word now solves one of my own problems. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So, uh, the, the, the distinction. A... Um, Someone who is now is a sentient race, like a race with, uh, with sentience, intelligence, and free will, as opposed to beasts, right? You have beasts and you have now. So you can have lots of species and they can be intelligent, but are they, are they self-aware? Do they have free will? Do they have, uh, do they have real sentience? Um, that's what a, what a now is. So he's emphasizing the tree folk, um, Are they are they, in some in some ways rather stupid? Are the tree folk, now that have gone tree like, or trees that have become now? Now keep in mind. When Tolkien asks, when Tolkien suggests that Ents might be in some ways rather stupid, I very much doubt he is using the word stupid in the way that modern people use, that modern Americans especially use the word stupid. Um, I suspect that when he says in some ways they're rather stupid, he means that in the uh, older sense of the word stupid. That is sleepy, out of it, right? Um, The word stupid is the adjectival form of the noun stupor, right? Um, So you you feel um, uh you feel stupid. I feel stupid every morning when I first wake up. Um, because the, what he says about them here seems to fit that older sense of the word stupid. That they're sleepy, they're dozy, right? They're, um, they're either now who have become like trees, or they're trees that have become now, but in either case, they're still kind of snoozy, right? Like trees might be. Um, exactly, Stephen, just like Sam blinking stupidly. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the, the old uh, the old usage. Uh, Sam is blinking stupidly next to Old Man Willow, isn't he? Isn't that where that where you're taking that from, Stephen? Um and yeah, if there's any, if there's ever a place to blink stupidly, it's next to Old Man Willow, and Old Man Willow is ca- is uh, is singing to you of sleep, right? That'll make anybody stupid. Um, Treebeard might be moveless, but here are some notes or suggestions. So maybe Treebeard is rooted, right? He doesn't he doesn't immediately go to the idea that they're walking around. Okay, but here are some thoughts. There are very few left. Not enough room. Time was when a fellow could walk and sing all day and hear no more than the echo of his voice in the mountains. So the contraction of the forest correlates with the dying out, almost dying out of the ants. So, so they, there, there should only be a few of them, and they're a relic, right? Their, their population is a relic of, a, of what had been a, a larger population. Difference between trolls, stone inhabited by goblin spirit, stone giants... And the tree folk, add in an ink, ents, and that's the place where the word ents is first used in its new sense, right? Um, not to mean giant anymore, but now as 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 the word that he's going to use to describe the tree folk here. Um, trolls. That last sentence, I don't even know what to do with. That is, this kind of blows my mind. Um, That trolls are stone inhabited by a goblin spirit. I don't feel like I understand that. What's a goblin spirit? The spirit of a goblin? Spirit of a dead goblin? Right? I mean, is it like... Do good goblins come back as trolls because their spirits go into stone? Or bad goblins come back as... Is it... I don't, I don't understand. I don't... I don't is it... Uh, yeah, they're like goblin barrow whites. 
Jennifer, I guess, right? In a sense, the spirits of goblins somehow go into rock or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah, Brianna, exactly. Are these Maiar? Are these goblin spirits in a broader sense, right? Like goblin, you know, sort of like goblin deity type things, right? Goblins, you know, Maiar, which are like goblins. Um, maybe this is the kind of necromancy the necromancer was up to, Brandon. It could be, right? It could be spirits of dead goblins, right? Um, just as some spirits are forced into wolves, right? To make werewolves. Um, apparently some spirits can be forced into stone to make giants, to make trolls, um, to make stone giants. So wait, the stone giants in The Hobbit were actually trolls? And that's interesting. And that seems to me to make sense, right? Because having decided he's not going to do giants, originally he was going to put giants in. Treebeer was going to be a giant, right? Um, so we're going to check off that folktale, fairy tale box, right? Um, giants, right? Cool. But now, no, we're not going to make giants, right? We're going to have tree folk. We're going to have ants instead of giants. But wait, oh shoot, what about the Hobbit? Hobbit has giants, stone giants, right? Make them trolls. Just make them trolls. That'd be simpler. Um, so I guess that's what stone giants are. Um, yeah, maybe Kate, maybe you're right, Kate, that he's listing three different things. I don't know if he's talking about two things or three things. Um, trolls, stone giants, and tree folk. Are these three categories or... Trolls, stone inhabited by goblin spirit, stone giants. Maybe they are three separate. Or is like stone giant the like synonym of stone inhabited by goblin spirits? And it would make sense if he wanted to tidy up the giants, having decided to go in a non-giant direction, or non-traditional giant direction anyway. And the stone giants of The Hobbit are much more traditional giants. Yeah. I could see that being three if he wanted to still hang on to the stone giants, but I'm not really sure. I guess, Kate, if I had to guess, I would. Maybe they are three. I don't know. Not really sure. We'll have to see. Look for other references to giants as we move forward. We finally get, of course, the full tree beard. Treebeard is anxious for news. He never hears much, but he smells things in the air. Prefers breath from south and west of the sea. Too much east wind these days. He is bothered about Saruman, a machine-minded man, fondest of Gandalf, very upset at news of his fall. Only one of the wizards, only one of the wizards who understood trees, tells how the horsemasters have ridden away south, leaving land empty. There are only three of us left. Myself and Skinbark and Leaflock, written above in ink, Fangorn, Fladrib, changed to Fladrif, Finglas. Saruman has got hold of Skinbark. He went off to Isengard some time ago, presumably not under his own volition, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, Leaflock has gone treeish. He seldom comes into the hills, has taken to standing half asleep all through the summer with the deep grass of the meadows round his knees. Covered with leaves he is. Wakes up a bit in winter. Maybe somewhere about. Treebeard offers to take them across Rohan, to or towards Minas Tirith. Treebeard smells war. They see a battle of wolf riders, Saruman, and the horsemasters. Wild flowing hair and little bows. <laughs> okay. Can I just say, I don't think that came out right. Wild, wild flowing hair and little bows. Which, of course, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't help but think of little bows in the wild flowing hair, right? And my only question left is, who has the little bows in their hair? Is it the wolf riders or the horse masters who have wild flowing hair and little bows? Um, I, I'm not sure, Jennifer, that's exactly my question. Uh, uh, and, yeah, so I, I, uh, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I assume he means small bows to shoot with, like from the back of of a of a of a of a moving mount, right? Uh, and I'm still not sure who has the little bows. Um, probably the wolf riders are shooting bows at the horse masters, but it might be the Rohirrim. The Rohirrim are archers as well, so um, and who are skilled from shooting from the back of a moving horse. So I I I don't know yet. Yeah, now, Kate, the idea that the wolves have the little bows in their hair is is even nicer, actually. Um, so. Uh, yeah, probably. The f- also, flowing hair is a Rohirrim thing, right? You know, it's in the song, right? Um, the hair that was flowing. So probably it's the Rohirrim, the horse masters, uh, who have the flowing hair and the little bows. Um, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm just, I'm really, I'm trying not to think of the, the sort of the juvenile, um, uh, you know, image of little elementary school girl bows uh, in their hairs. Um, in, in in their hair. But anyway, yeah. Um, uh, but enough of the of the of the silly part here. A few ents, right? The three oldest ents, Skinbark, Leaflock, and Treebeard are all there, and they're the only ones left. Uh, excuse me, we're down to two because Skinbark has been accompanied to Isengard uh, sometime before. Um, uh, fascinating that he is originally thinking of the Ents being almost unique, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what else was I going to emphasize through all this? Again, we see the, uh, the, the, the tree-ishness of Leaflock, right? That's part of his character from the beginning there. Um, Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I wanted to mention, Brandon, thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, I, I never, I, for, I forgot to explain what I realized about now. Um, some of you may have been with me long enough to remember, I I can't remember in what context I talked about this, whether it was one of the Signum classes or whether it was uh, broadcast from long ago, but I've been looking for the perfect collect, like, noun that I can use to describe uh, like elves and men together, like the the races together, right? I wanted to, you know, there's like mortals and immortals, but I wanted a, I wanted a, 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 an adjective that was kind of like mortal or immortal, like on the same sort of level, but that would embrace all of them and different to differentiate them from, uh, from the Valar. Um, and the best one, um, yeah, Yana, did I t- was that the, back in the Silmarillion seminar? That seems quite likely that I talked about that in the Silmarillion seminar. Um, I really because I, I didn't have a good term to use to speak collectively of the of those races. Um, I can't can't call them created races because Valar are created too. Um, so I think eventually I went with incarnate races, which is kind of awkward. But of course, now is the perfect word. Like, that's the word, that's that's exactly how Tolkien is using it, right? That's why Tolkien is using it, because he, too, finds it to be the perfect word uh, to describe that. So he's adopting Lewis's word. Um, so why shouldn't I? Now is obviously uh, the, the word there. So, Brandon, that's what I was realizing. All of a sudden, that dilemma that I have been having for the last, what, eight years now, um, I just solved or just realized that I should have solved ages and ages ago. Um, so, uh, so yeah, now that's clearly, that's clearly the word I'm looking for there. All right. Well, it's getting late. I started late, but I should let you guys go. Um, let's see. We're talking about plant. Yeah. We'll come back to tree beer next time. All right. No problem. Well, adding an, an extra class, we've got, a, we've got plenty of time here. So, um, uh, no, uh, no problem here. Um, exactly, Julie. It leaves out the Valar because, like, the Valar would not be now uh, just like uh, just like the Eldil just like the the Eldili don't 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 count as uh, uh, as as now either. 
Okay. Yeah. So we'll see. Yana, I hope to have some time for some Q and A. We'll see what we can do there. Um, but thanks for joining me. We'll come back uh, to uh, uh, continue with our discussion of Treebeard and the Ents and move forward into the Gandalf stuff. So we're supposed to just finish the book for next time. Might as well finish. We're not going to get all the way through next time. We'll save some for the last class, but uh, uh, we'll still have uh, still have plenty to do next time. Thanks, everybody. I will see you guys next week uh, on uh, uh, All Souls Day. So thanks, everybody. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at Sig.